This episode of Rise Radio features Justin Lyon, CEO of Simidine, and Ben Davey, CEO of Barclays Ventures. In this episode, we talk about agent-based simulation, Simidine's journey from accelerator to working with Barclays, the role of mentors, and Ben introduces Barclays Ventures. Thanks for listening and enjoy the conversation. Hi, I'm Justin Lyon, the founder and CEO of Simudine. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning, I'm Ben Davey. Uh, two years uh, being the group head of strategy at Barclays and now the CEO of Barclays UK Ventures. And you're listening to Rise Radio. Justin and Ben, thanks for being on the show here in Rise London. To kick off in the traditional banking way, I need to authenticate you. We wouldn't normally do this together, clearly in an authentication situation, but in this case, I'll, I'll ask you each a question if that's all right. So, Justin, if I could start with, what's your favourite animal? A lion. <laughs> <laughs> Why a lion? Um, well, obviously, my last name is Lion, and uh, so I've, I've always had an affinity for lions. Um, and when I was a little child, my mother used to buy me all these little different types of stuffed animals, and they sort of I've kept them over the years. Now my daughters have them. Uh, so I always talk about lions, and I had a chance to go to safari, see lions. I just love lions. I, I don't know. I have since I was a child. Oh, amazing. Where did you go? Uh, Adini Game Reserve. So I used to work as a wrangler, uh, taking um, people on horseback ride to see uh, big games. So I was the backup rider. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was enjoyable. Excellent. And, and Ben, a question for you, if I may. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's your most used app? Uh, probably Spotify and, and Sonos. Oh really? Music, yeah, yeah, then. yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, look, obviously, with uh, kids in the house, uh, it's a bit of a battle to work out who's got the speakers. But uh, look, as, a, as an app and, and as a function, it's just fantastic. Cool. And is there a particular type of music you like listening to? Uh, to my uh, children's disdain, uh, probably a lot of '80s type stuff. Uh, <laughs> but you know, Excellent. some Lenny Kravitz, it's, that sort it's, of stuff. It's coming back, man. Yeah, <laughs> never went away. <laughs> never went away. <laughs> <laughs> So look, I mean, I'm interested, Justin, to ask you how did you how did you start off on this this entrepreneurial journey? Wow, that's um, so. I've always been an entrepreneur. So I was uh, in university. I started building websites in 1994, the earliest days of the World Wide Web, and uh, I sold the company in 1998 when I graduated from university. And then I joined Agency.com, which was a, a scale up that we took public on Nasdaq. So I sort of got bitten by the entrepreneurial bug in university. And uh, then after 9-11, I, I did mathematical modeling at MIT and uh, sort of got interested in doing uh, simulations and started uh, Simi9 you know, ages ago to look at uh, you know, modeling complex adaptive systems it's, uh, over time. So I've always been an entrepreneur, I guess. It's sort of uh, just, I don't know, MIT and A maybe. In your DNA, did you do a course related to that or, or did it just... But was it just no, something that you were driven to do? I did biochemistry oh, really? as an undergraduate, yeah. Uh, I didn't know anything about business. I literally had to get one of the business law professors to help me because uh, I didn't even know like what an LLC is, what is a corporation, how do you set it up. I didn't understand any of that sort of stuff. So one of the business law professors sort of took pity on me and helped me at the university sort of set it up and get it all organized. So I've, I've, I've learned you know, just reading lots and lots of different books um, and then just sort of the school of hard knocks, just doing it. Okay. And you mentioned Simudine. Uh, clearly, Simudine's an organisation that's based here in Rise London. It is. You've got a lovely office up on the 12th floor. Which, <laughs> uh, sorry, 12th floor? 5th floor. Sorry, 5th floor. Um, so, uh, can you just give us a little bit of information about, about Simudine, the organisation? Yeah, sure. It's a, so, we're a software company that makes it easy for banks and other financial institutions to build AI-powered simulations. So, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey for us. I you know, started as a consulting business, uh, learning, you know, building uh, computational simulations using all sorts of interesting third-party software, which are effectively now our competitors. Um, and I realized there was this opportunity to build a next-generation simulation platform. So, that's what we set out to, did, uh, to do and have mm -hmm. successfully done. Um, and we entered the... Uh, the Barclays Accelerator, powered by Techstars, um, last year, which was utterly transformational for us because, you know, even though I had done these two other businesses, I had never built a product company. I had never built a software company. I, you know, the companies we, I had worked with before were effectively services businesses. So I had a lot to learn, um, a lot to unlearn, actually. Uh, so this whole program and being part of this whole accelerator was really transformational for us. Excellent. Okay, and Ben, is this is this where you ended up meeting Simidine? And if you did, what attracted you to 
to, to start working with them? Uh, so, y- y- yes, it was. Um, at the back end of our uh, process to select uh, our core cohort, uh, we have a, effectively a Dragon's Den type day where different parts of Barclays are in the room and, and obviously the very best of the applicants. We have about 600 or so for each cohort. Uh, so to have got to the Dragon's Den in its own right is, is, is a great achievement. Uh, and we then sort of work through between 20 and 30, depending on the, on the, uh, on the length of the day. Uh, and so anyway, I was um, quietly sitting at the back of the room. You had all different parts of the organisation represented. And uh, I think Justin, Jonathan, one or two others were were making the presentation and the experience that they had themselves as individuals and then as a team for me stood out. The other piece, though, that in particular I found very interesting was um, whilst clearly it was an excellent presentation, there wasn't any individual part of the organisation that felt, ah, this is exactly what we've been looking for. But at the same time, you could see that many were seeing the potential application uh, of, of the agent-based uh, modelling and simulation capability. And so with my group strategy hat on, um, it felt to me like exactly the right sort of company uh, to say, look, rather than try and make it very specific to Barclays in one way or another, let's take it on as a group capability, help Justin and the team navigate around the organisation, and hopefully there'll be a number of different potential use cases that come up as a result of that approach. And uh, look, uh, I think from our perspective, uh, it's worked in incredibly well. Uh, it's, it's been great, really, absolute pleasure to, to work with the team. Uh, and as we maybe come on to in, in due course, you know, we're starting to find some really, I think, fascinating and potentially very exciting use cases. Oh, really? I mean, could either of you ask which, what, what particular use cases uh, would you would you suggest? Um, look, we've we've been through a number of uh, our business units. Um, so you know, obviously, uh, in terms of Barclays, we've got uh, both wholesale and consumer uh, businesses, very large ones in in both areas, uh, and and those are areas that I think, in due course, uh, we are going to be able to move on to. But actually, the 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 area of the organisation that resonated immediately as we as we got into the detailed conversations is risk, our risk function. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, in the context of different parts of our our risk capability. We've been working with Justin and the team uh, on two two areas. I mean, there'll be many others that we've got on a sort of long list of ideas. Uh, but first is understanding uh, the interconnections within the banking system. Uh, and the second is actually the interconnections uh, within the SME community. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I'm sure Justin will come on to is the benefits of agent-based modelling is they, they, and simulation is it, it, it comes at a problem uh, from a different perspective. Some of our traditional models you know, have been back-tested, we've been using for years and, and work very well. But actually the capability that's introduced uh, through um, Simodyne's capability is looking at some of the chestnut problems in a completely different way. And if you're sitting in risk, uh, actually, you're, you know, by definition, there's very rarely a single answer. What you're really looking for is obviously a range of possible answers looked at from many different perspectives. And that's clearly where uh, agent-based modelling and simulation is, is, I think, likely to end up playing uh, potentially quite an important role. Excellent. I think just to build on that, you know, carrying with this lion thing in, in Safari, I mean, the Bank of England has this concept, um, Andy Haldane, the chief economist, talks about uh, you know, the zoo of models. Uh, and this idea where in risk and in other parts of the business, you want to have a, a, a multiple of perspectives of how you look at the risk that you're facing, how you look at the world, and how you understand um, the financial ecosystem in which you're operating. And I think that's really some of the power of agent-based models. You've got this really bottom-up approach to understanding financial markets um, and being able to explore, you know, if you take out a particular part of the financial system, what's the implication and the impact on the rest of the, you know, how does it spread? How does that uh, spread like almost like a contagion? So this idea of zoo of models, I always love that metaphor that, that uh, the bank uses there uh, to sort of explain this concept of looking at challenger models and so forth. So... Uh, it's, it's fascinating. And I, and I think it is, because I think that at the moment everybody is talking about AI or machine learning or how it's going to affect the workforce or how it's going to do something within their organisation. But you you consciously, or certainly from what I've heard, talk a lot about simulation sure. rather than those two um, uh, elements. Why and, and, and how does that... Um, take you further forward in terms of what you're doing as an organization? Yeah. Well, I sometimes joke that I, I view simulation as the bedrock for generalized AI. And, and the reason why is if you look at, you know, how did we develop 
you know, algorithms that beat our smartest players at Go. Well, step one is we built a simulation of the game Go, and then the AI algorithm, through repeated self-play, were able to train themselves effectively to become, you know, just absolutely world-class Go players. So if you're, if you're looking at simulations, you use them to train intelligence. So it can be used to train human intelligence. So if you're you know, chief risk officer or risk manager, you're, you're using it to really hone your skills so that no matter what the world throws at you, you've built a resilient organization. So that's sort of the key focus for organizations like Barclays is they want to be resilient to anything the world throws at them. Um, and, and that's really powerful. So this idea of training intelligence the same way that a, you know, a pilot might train in a flight simulator. But you can also use these simulations to train artificial intelligences. And that's what I find is really fascinating, is once you're able to build these high-fidelity models of complex adaptive systems of financial markets and economies, you can use them to train the humans or the AIs. Okay, and do you see that being typically used to solve local problems, or could this this be something on a world scale? Uh, well, what do you what, I mean? It, I mean, there's a, the simulation can be used to address all sorts of different challenges across financial services, but in other industries as well. So, you know, when you look at predictive analytics, I think that you know it's a combination of machine learning and computational simulation that gives you really robust forecast. Mm-hmm. So, okay. it's not an or; it's an and. Yeah, and that's so important because. Um, you know, correlation modeling, you know, machine learning approaches are incredibly powerful. Computational simulation approaches, where you're actually getting into the causative factors of, of uh, you know, understanding an economy, are, is also really powerful. But when you link them together, it becomes you know truly amazing. And I could talk more about that. But I mean, what, do you have what, do you want anything about the? Yeah, well, only only just to to actually agree that it, it's probably um, neither one nor the other. And and what we're finding. Uh, and, and sort of comes back to the central debate around around AI is it, it's actually the hybrid model of uh, AI uh, attaching to in, in Justin's explanation uh, what you can do using you know, built bottom up simulation and then the human interaction in in the use cases that we're we're looking at uh, clearly of our risk department and the experts who have been doing it for years and and really at the coal phase playing all of those in together then obviously by definition starts to create something pretty interesting. Yeah. So, so, so by definition, no, by, sorry, by definition, you're you're looking into the future to some extent of, of what's going to happen, say, 30, 40 years out. Yeah. Is there anything interesting that you'd like to share with the listeners that you can see <laughs> happening that we should all be, be 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 potentially interested in or worried about? Yeah. I, so I, I always try to make it really clear for people that we have agency in the world as human beings, right? So when you use simulation to to sort of forecast the future, you're effectively creating, you're trying to understand the cause and effect relationships, you're trying to create a sense of what are the likely plausible sets of futures for for your organization or for the world. Um, But they're not etched in stone, right? So so the same science that we use to sort of forecast and understand weather and how that's approaching us, and we're, we're looking into the future, we're getting a sense of what is the probability of rain, the hurricane coming, and so on. But unlike the weather, you know, we can't change the weather, okay? But we can make economic decisions, we can make business decisions that if we see a storm coming, right, an economic storm coming, we can make decisions. And that storm will disappear like a you know, harmless summer shower. And that's the difference between simulation of the future when it comes to meteorology, which we can't change, and simulation of the future with economics, which we can actually take action and change it. Um, so in terms of like point predictions, we can create whatever future we want. And from a Barclays perspective, how, how do we see ourselves tapping into that kind of um, asset to some extent for us to be able to lean on? Yeah, so if you pick up uh, Justin's explanation and, and you think about it in terms of um, the, the sorts of characteristics that banks are very focused on, uh, obviously the macroeconomic outlook is, is something that is is key. Understanding the potential implications of um economic growth or economic contraction and flowing that through simulation models and then depending on ultimately what your internal management thesis is uh, on the potentially most likely outcome to justin's point um, you know in in a risk context for example you can then uh, tune down your risk appetite you can um, increase the uh, the thresholds uh, around uh, risk limits and so forth depending on your view uh, and thus, uh, hopefully, position uh, the bank on behalf of our customers and clients, and, and also obviously the bank itself, 
in an appropriate way for whatever it is that you think you know, from the simulations is likely to be the next particular macroeconomic outcome. And so that's one, that's one uh, I think, very good example. Um, another one uh, is to the extent that the uh, modeling allows you to understand interconnections, be it within your target client base or a particular part of the country where uh, you're obviously very active as a business, doesn't even need to be a bank, obviously. Um, if you've understood the interconnections properly between your business and your customers and clients, and then as between your customers and clients, uh, you understand uh, ultimately you know, what, for example, the impacts would be of an economic downturn, or indeed you can understand if there were a Carillion type event, what the potential consequences uh, could be for a region or indeed a, a collection of your very important customers. And, and so thinking hard about how you play in the capability that simulation provides into hopefully good customer-centric um, business uh, and banking is, is certainly where I'm uh, in particular very interested in the work that's being done. Okay. So, so, so Justin, my, my, my question to you on this is, is you're working with Barclays at the moment. Um, we talked about agent-based modelling, and um, I understand that you're um, helping us to set up a centre of excellence because um, employees or, or individuals that are, that are working on this need to have some level of understanding and training to be able to, 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 to take this on and forward. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what you're putting in place for us? Yeah, well, this is a great idea that Barclays had, um, which which we're super happy to help with. I mean, so so what they what 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 Barclays I forget to speak for you guys. <laughs> so what Barclays does that's really compelling is they set up. Um, uh, so they've done this with machine learning, and they're now doing it with with computational simulation. The center of excellence is an opportunity to allow the community, you know, the developers, the modelers across the bank to come together. And what we're doing is we're working with a number of professors, um, you know, different reading materials, you know, bringing that together almost into, uh, not really a course, but like a set of materials, you know, that you can go and you can listen, you can have a conversation. They've got really, um, really nice rooms where you can come together, um, you know, they have videos, people can join remotely, you record it, you have a conversation, people can ask questions. Um, and it's this idea of trying to bring some of the brightest people from the academic world together who've studied this for, for years um, with you know, practitioners in the real world, so to speak, who are actually having to do this in anger for, for you know, under incredible time pressures to meet all sorts of important deadlines um, and allow them to have this conversation and, and sort of um, have those ideas spread across the organization. So it's very much a grassroots bottom-up approach to allowing the developer community within Barclays and the modeling community within Barclays to really start to understand how they could use this, the value that it would generate for the business, and to just crack on doing it. Yeah, so th this is a really, um, I think, exciting initiative. And uh, you know, in many ways, the the way that the accelerator is now working in the ecosystem, the, the great companies that, as a result, we're getting an opportunity to meet. You know, we're really beginning, I think, to develop new ways of working. And so, the Centre of Excellence, I think, is a fantastic initiative. Um, by definition, uh, we can't be experts in everything that we would like to to, to excel in. And so, having uh, people like uh, Justin and and the Simidine team help us develop, learn, educate in a way where it's not the uh, sort of classic, you know, you've got half an hour on the side of your desk to go off and, and study, but try and put it into people's days so that we recognize that this is a long-term skill set we want people to uh, to develop and learn, um, that we can tap and, and ask the best in the industry to help us in that process. And uh, hopefully over time also make a contribution back, which as Justin's touched on, you know, may well be just um, translating capabilities into real day problems that we're trying to solve. And hopefully as a result, everyone gains from it. I think the, um, the initiative itself uh, is, is a great step forward. And um, to Justin's point, you know, we can hopefully scale it across a whole number of different centres of excellence over time. Excellent. Well, I look forward to watching with interest to see what comes out of that. Yeah. So, um, in terms of plans for this year, if I can start with Justin and then come to you, Ben, if that's mm. all right. So, Justin, what are your plans for the, the year ahead? Uh, so, uh, for the company, um, so yeah, so, so right now we're really focused on helping Barclays and a couple of other banking customers um, you know, adopt our software, uh, use it in anger. Um, I think it's important to understand that you know, when we entered um, the program, you know, we thought we had product market fit, um, but we had the, the, I mean, Ben and his team, you know, introduced us across the bank. And that allowed us to gather all sorts of really amazing feedback. 
which we then created into a massive backlog of things that we want to address and, and to improve uh, in our product. So, you know, key focus for us um, uh, this year is to just continue to relentlessly improve the software. So we've just launched a couple days ago version 2.0 of the software. It incorporates a lot of great ideas that, that we got from uh, the teams across Barclays, you know, features that they wanted to see to meet their sort of, you know, pressing requirements. Um, so that sort of iterative collaborative process, so executing the backlog. Um, you know, certainly, you know, we raised capital at the end of the uh, Techstars Barclays program, so we're going to be raising additional capital this year. Uh, so starting that process um, you know, sometime this year. Uh, and sales, you know, right now it's all about execution for us. So we've we've got our product out, you know, it's it's meeting the requirements for the the risk managers that want to use it. So it's getting additional banks, uh, other financial institutions to to use the software. So a very busy year. Yeah, it's crazy busy right now. It's uh, lots and lots of meetings, lots of talking, lots of flights. I mean, I just landed from Santa Monica, so you know, basically was flew there. Was on stage for a couple hours with the you know the CEOs of uh, Bar- of Cloudera and uh, a whole bunch of analysts, and then immediately ran out and jumped on a plane and got back here because I had a meeting with with the bank. <laughs> Well, you're looking good on it. What Thanks, can I say? Yeah, yeah you're looking good on it. And, and, and Ben, earlier on at the, at the start of the, the podcast, you mentioned um, Barclays Ventures. Um, I think you've got a pretty exciting year ahead of you. Um, is there anything you're able to share with us at this time? Yes, well, uh, we, we literally launched on on Monday of this week, so uh, it's a it's a really exciting opportunity. So, um, big picture is we've created a new business unit within Barclays UK. The purpose of which is ultimately to help uh, Barclays UK as a whole grow, help Barclays grow, uh, with a view to identifying uh, at least one, if I'm lucky, uh, truly transformational business line. Uh, The way that we're going to do that um, is to operate on a semi-autonomous basis. We obviously have great relationships with uh, the core of Barclays, and and that will be one of the strengths that we draw on. But also with a blank piece of paper uh, and a a relatively unfettered mandate, be able to explore uh, potentially new business lines for Barclays. Um, we're going to uh, obviously uh, fail many times, uh, and one of the things that we will be uh, very careful to introduce is a, is a culture that um, recognises that actually failing in the right way quickly uh, is actually a, a hugely powerful thing for us. Uh, but again, if we're lucky and we're putting in place a team which will include both uh, best of class in Barclays and, and some great external hires as well, we're putting in place teams who will be able to go after new models, uh, literally with blank pieces of paper, scaling up concepts into, if we're very lucky, sort of live production, uh, and on the way through, uh, hopefully uh, contribute to the core operation as well. Uh, so it's a, a, a sort of huge, uh, huge adventure for us. Uh, absolutely great to be to be uh, up and running this week. Um, but at the same time, in many ways, the conversation that we've had now with, with Simodyne uh, for well over a year is is hopefully an example of how we will continue to work with the outside world. Because one of the things that we're going to be very disciplined on is recognizing what is um, strategic and core to Barclays, uh, and we want to do ourselves versus things that actually are far better developed in partnership. Uh, And indeed, those where, frankly, we may not even be the best party to be in the lead, uh, but actually working with others, helping them develop their businesses, contributing kind or uh, maybe capital, it may be ideas, it may be business use cases. We're going to be very open to each of those possible routes. And uh, hopefully with the team that we're putting in place and working with partners like Sim and I ultimately get to very good answers for Barclays. So a very, very full year for you too. Wow. (laughs) Sounds very, very exciting. And, you know, I'm sure... There's been some media um, uh, around this that, that people will be watching with interest to see how Barclays Ventures grows both internally and externally out in the marketplace. So look, um, a couple of last question for both of you, if I may. Start with you, Justin. Have you, if, if I could ask you, if you were to give three tips to budding entrepreneurs, given your background and your knowledge of, of what goes on, were there, could you give three that you could share to our, our listeners? Uh, three tips for budding entrepreneurs. So... Um I think the first one I always, I always say, so if you're selling into financial service institutions, I, I typically would recommend three years of operating capital. Okay. Um, so that, so so that may mean that you raise a significant amount of money, or you stay really lean. <laughs> yeah. Or both, right? 
Uh, so I think that's the first thing is to raise enough capital to be able to survive for three years. And that's just a function of um, you know, the complexity of interacting with a large global uh, financial institution. I think the second sort of thing would probably be um, never quit. Just, uh, you know, when on this journey with Simudine, we've, we've had some real challenges where we thought we had product market fit, maybe we didn't, um, you know, the, this whole challenge. And so I, I've met a lot of people that, you know, they want to start a business and they, they sort of um, have almost like a, a vision of, of what that will look like. And it's almost like it's a myth. It's a myth. It's a dream. But in reality, when you actually get into it, it's bloody difficult. Excuse me, it's just incredibly difficult. It's long hours. Uh, when you identify a problem, you have to solve it. There's no one you can delegate it to. It's just you. And, and even when you have a little, you know, few team members, you're your co-founders, it's just you you guys and, and gals just so, sorting the challenge. And it just means that uh, it's really tiring. And a lot of people just quit. And they quit oftentimes right when they're getting ready to, to cross the finish line. Uh, and the third uh, recommendation, which is the exact opposite of what I just said, is make sure you're ready to quit if you are failing. Um, because the other thing that you can do is you can hang on a bit too long and, uh, and then never really acknowledge that you've actually failed. And this idea that uh, you've been just mentioned about failing fast, it's, so, it's, 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 it's sort of a, uh, the mantra in the world is that you, you have to fail quick and, and learn. Right. Yeah. So if you just hang on and you don't actually allow yourself to fail and, and take the learning, you know, you know <laughs> then you know, that's it's, it's the exact opposite. It's, it's you know, raise three years of operating capital, never quit, and if you're failing, fail fast. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and Ben, um, if I can flip that slightly, mm-hmm. uh, uh, if you can give three top tips for entrepreneurs wanting to work with a bank. Look, I think the uh, the starting point. Uh, is to identify maybe one person, maybe more than one, but but someone who is able to help you navigate around the big organisation. Um, you know, with the best one in the world, it is it is difficult to find the right people, the people who will connect. And if you can find someone who knows the organisation you're trying to work with intimately and can move you around the organisation until you find that right connection, that right opportunity, it's incredibly powerful. So that that would be the first thing. I think the second, uh, touching on, I think, one of the themes that Justin mentioned uh, is be crystal clear on the problem that you are solving rather than the solution that you have. It, it's obviously a, a sort of well-understood statement, but I, I mean, I myself have been learning uh, um, both working with Justin and the team, but also as we started to, to set up our new business. Um, you know, we are going to be very, very clear on the problems that we believe we need to solve for our customers and clients. And we are going to try and make sure that we don't assume we found the solution with the very first thing we come up with, but be willing to spin through. And I think uh, understanding a your capability, but then being very flexible around you know, recognizing what the problem is that you're trying to help someone solve is, is going to be key. And then I think the third thing, uh, and again, likely to apply in any any big bank or, or certainly any big organization, is understand where you are likely to hit red flags relating to controls in relation to governance, um, regulation, uh, because uh, there will be some immovable objects. However creative, however determined you are, there are certain things, particularly obviously in, in banking as a, as a heavy regulated industry, which are immovable. And having people um, both you know, in your operation, if you're lucky enough to have them, or at the very least in your partner bank, able to spot those for you in the context of your proof of concept, uh, tell you where they are truly immovable or where there is alternatively an established practice which is acceptable, can save you a lot of time. And that's probably one of my principal learnings, having worked with, with Justin and the team over the last year or so, was to try and get ahead of where some of those control areas were likely to bite uh, and think very constructively about whether they were immovable or indeed there was just a, a different way of having to do things. So those would be my three. Brilliant. Six top tips. Thank you very much, both of you. And, and thank you both very much for coming in. Justin, appreciate you getting off a flight and getting here and <laughs> well, spending some time with us. Ben, thank you very much just at the start of this new business, actually taking some time out to talk to us today. Thank you both. A big pleasure.
Twitter handle at ThinkRise Global. Um, or if you're internal to Barclays, via our Group Innovation Office intranet page. We'd love to hear your thoughts on feedback. Um, and if you have any suggestions for podcasts, please also get in touch. Thank you for tuning in. If you're new to Rise Radio, welcome. This podcast exists to give you access to fintechs and Barclays entrepreneurs working with Rise to create the future of financial services in an appreciable and easy to consume way. Subscribe and please share with colleagues, clients, partners and friends and we'll catch up with you in the next episode. Until then, keep innovating.